Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I have a very special guest coming up. Really excited, really looking forward to talking to him. Heavily armed clown uh, who co-founded, created uh, together with Ben Prentice, uh, WTF in 1971.com. What the fuck happened in 1971? You know, the suspension of the redeemability of uh, notes into gold. And so we're going to talk really cosmic, really deep down rabbit hole. What does it mean? Inflation, inf uh, deflation, golds, uh, uh, you know, flaws, extreme flaws, monetary properties. What does it mean for the future on a Bitcoin standard in a hyper Bitcoinized world? What, you know, what's the pain point we're waiting for? How is this process going to evolve uh, with what kind of speed and intensity? So really looking forward without further ado, this is my talk with Heavily Armed Clone. Let me know your questions, please. Uh, my DM me or write me an email, hello at the totalconnector.com or kd at kvandavani.com. Please follow Heavily Armed Clown on Twitter. I'm going to put those in the show notes, all his links, his websites. And without further ado, have fun listening to our talk and give me your feedback. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Sure. So you mean with the background story on how we created it, right? Not the history that, of the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, really all it was, was that, you know, Ben and I started hanging out with each other online uh, after I started my podcast focused on Bitcoin, because he just reached out to me one day and, and wanted to have a chat. And he ended up eventually coming on the show and him and I talked more and more. And we found that we had a lot in common. We had read a lot of the same books. Uh, we were thinking through a lot of the same things together in regards to Bitcoin. And, and we've discovered that we both love economics and economic history. So WTF 1971 started as Ben and I's nerd chat back and forth, sharing charts and data and history with one another and saying, wow, things, you know, you look at all of these economic metrics uh, across, you know, the, the scope of, of macroeconomics in the last hundred years, and things all go nuts at 1971. And this was something I think Saifedean had mentioned at 1.2. And um, just in our study of economic history and, and looking into the Nixon shock and saying, you know, a, as an Austrian, you, you try to look at things like on a, on a rational, uh, a priori basis, and you try to um, build from logical deduction. You start with your first principles, and then you build up from logical deduction. And as an Austrian, you should think, okay, well, if they change the money that dramatically, there should be uh, widespread sweeping effects throughout the whole of society. And if you look at the data, you'll see that that's actually uh, completely true. And that was really all it was, was Ben said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if like we threw all this, all these graphs up on a website so that w whenever we're arguing with randoms on Twitter, we can say, um, well, why don't you go check out this data and decide for yourself? And that's really what it started as. And then we were fortunately prescient enough to sort of protect the meme that we had built around this data. And it's just sort of snowballed from there. Right. So, you know, the question I always ask myself, I mean, maybe I can just show this for the YouTube viewers, uh, your website, what uh, WTF happened in 1971. Um, it, the, the thing is that what is really unexpected when once, if you look at it for the first time is, uh, is the, you know, the levels of, of, of uh, the levels that got changed. I mean, on, in every field, in every sphere of society, whether it be divorce rates, uh, education, or uh, people, you know, young people, students, uh, not, you know, being able to, to take care of themselves or to, you know, not being able to live uh, by themselves in their own apartment, but, you know, uh, more, more uh, tightly, you know, knit together with the family in one house, in one household. So, uh, you know, the, the poverty, the, I mean, everything that you can think of. So the question I think I've been asking myself is like, what if Nixon or the, you know, Nixon administration or whatever the government did, had not, you know, gone in on, you know, into that, into that route? What if, what if it did, hadn't changed? Could we like positively now, now, you know, in retrospect, now, just the theoretically, uh, you know, maybe extrapolate this into positive effect, like, uh, could have been like, you know, more prosperity, abundance, you know, to, you know, uh, to a lot of growth, you know, what I'm saying like, what, what would have been the reverse, if it hadn't uh, happened? So I, I don't, I actually don't think that that's possible. Um, and, and 
there's a two I have a two part answer to that question. The first is really simple. Um, I don't necessarily you know, I'm not brazen enough to say that all of these macroeconomic trends happened in a vacuum. Right. Like certainly um, things other than just ending the gold standard contributed to some of these effects that you see on this page. Now, granted, our core thesis is that the <clears throat> disruption of the monetary system is the is the core driver of a lot of these macroeconomic effects. But we also understand, you know, in 1971, they changed uh, divorce law in the United States and created what was called no fault divorce law, which allowed a man and woman to separate under conditions when neither party was legally at fault. Uh, and they could both sort of go their separate ways. And, and before that existed, divorces were much less common because of the way that it was handled legally. So you, certainly, uh, in, in many cases, there are other contributing factors to some of this data. And a lot of people call the website cherry picked for that reason, which um, they can call it whatever we want, they want. At this point, we're just putting charts on there that have interesting inflection points uh, in 1971. And we don't present any conclusions for the reader or the listener. Uh, we, we would love for them to come to their own conclusions. And in fact, a lot of people do. They, they use the website as a uh, tool for their crusade, whatever that crusade might be. You'll find that all over the internet, especially if you just search WTF 1971, you'll see people using that site for whatever it is that they believe, which is very interesting. Uh, but in regards to the second piece, what do I think would have happened if Nixon hadn't ended the convertibility of the dollar into gold? I think that that's a kind of a long story. Um, the, the best synopsis of this is if you go and read a book by Murray Rothbard called The History of Money and Banking in the United States. Because truthfully, uh, what happened in 1971 with Nixon closing the gold window was really the last domino in a long series of banking and uh, monetary policy decisions over like a, the previous century. Uh, it, you, you don't end up where Nixon was, where he was terminating the gold window, because it, and you have to understand, too, at that point, uh, the only people who really could and did redeem dollars for gold in the 1960s was other nation states. There weren't Americans taking their dollars down to the treasury and saying, okay, one ounce of gold, please, for my dollar. Uh, that just wasn't how it worked. And that, that hadn't been how it worked for at least 50 years, maybe probably longer. And a, a large part of that is due to the, to the banking policies, the legal monopolies around money creation and the legal monopolies around banking. Yeah. So because uh, the question of one of the uh, one of your followers, our followers is uh, Bianon, uh, it ties pretty, pretty well in. He's asking, I'd be interested about how gold's physicality led to fiat and mainly why gold bugs ignore this so much while they are the closest supporters next to Bitcoiners for sound hard money. I mean, that's that's a fact with it's be, you know, would be Ron Paul. I mean, I love Ron Paul, for example. He's, you know, he's a he's a really super intelligent, knowledgeable, you know, I would even declare him as an Austrian economist. Um, but what what is it like? Uh, there's different players, you know. With it be German speaking, like Markus Kral, Torsten Polite, Peter Schiff, you know, also like Goldberg. What, where does this ignorance or non-willingness, maybe even or stubbornness, to to really uh, comprehend the bigger picture and the essence of Bitcoin and what is it? What what the true potential uh, could mean? Yeah. So I love Ron Paul as well. I actually uh, owe Ron Paul my to my awakening it was uh ron paul's book and the fed that got me started down the, the austrian economics rabbit hole so i i owe him a lifetime of gratitude uh for everything that he's done um your your question is tough but no so i think i think a lot of it especially in in people's like peter schiff's case uh i, I think that the the libertarian ideology is generally speaking very conservative and i think that a lot of the ideas are very entrenched um and and when someone like you, you know go back and look at any of the austrian writers and, and many of them said that only commodities could be money uh because in in their circumstances they were that was all that that could exist uh and they were looking at the negative effects of a lot of these paper currencies, fiat monies, if you will, and uh, and debt currencies and, and debt-based systems. And they were saying, this is bad. Uh, this has a lot of, a lot of detrimental effects. 
uh, and the, the denouement of this is always total collapse. So that's, not, that's reasonable, right? That's understandable. Uh, what we can do now via technology is comparable in, in a lot of ways with uh, the natural limitations of a commodity money, uh, but we can do it digitally and we can do it globally and we can do it on top of this uncensorable um, peer-to-peer network and, and all of these wonderful things that technology enables us to do. Uh, to, to expect that the Austrians could have predicted that uh, with enough clarity that we have, you know, in the year 2020 is a little bit absurd. So you have to, as a libertarian, you have to be able to be conservative with your ideals and first principles, but also look at the way the world around us has changed. And I think in people's case, like Peter Schiff, you know, I think it's actually their, their gold bags in a lot of cases that obscure their ability to look beyond uh, the way technology is changing the landscape. But the specific question that you asked, uh, how does we go from gold to fiat money? I think it's important to make the distinction that we didn't go from gold to fiat money uh, because of the physicality of gold. We went from gold to paper banknotes and from paper banknotes to fiat. And that transition is very important because it took uh, quite a long time. It didn't happen overnight where we're suddenly we were where one night we're using gold bars to pay for our transactions and then the next day we're using uh, worthless pieces of paper that are not redeemable for anything. It was a long slow process of uh, gold consolidating in bank vaults, uh, paper banknotes being issued out by those banks, consolidation of power uh, at least in the United States uh, at, at the state at the state level of what banks were allowed to be created, whether or not they were allowed to be multi-branch, what uh, collaterals they had to hold in reserve, uh, how many notes and in what ways they could issue those notes, when and where those notes would be accepted outside of that bank's jurisdiction. All of these types of things created uh, layers of legal monopolies on top of both the banking system and the money creation process. And what you saw, and this is why I recommend Rothbard's History of Money and Banking so much, is because if you read that book, you'll see that throughout every major financial panic prior to the Great Depression, which there were quite a few in the United States, the number one most important tool that the government had in order to uh, prevent the cascade of liquidation, the liquidation of not only their debt, but the banks and the banks that were holding their debt, the liquidation of that debt and the redemption of specie uh, is what Rothbard calls it, which is when you take your bank notes back to the bank and you say, okay, give me my gold bars. The number one tool that the government had in those circumstances was to suspend the redemption of specie meaning to disrupt the process when the market makes itself whole, when the tide goes out and you see who's still wearing shorts. By uh, government enacting legislation that suspended redemption of specie, then that liquidation process was at least slowed down for the time being. So if you fast forward that out to 1933, you know, when, when FDR made it illegal for the U.S. citizens to own gold, in 1971 when the gold window was closed entirely, all those things really are, are an extension of that banking policy that the United States has been using for 150 years. And that was suspension of redemption of specie, disruption of settlement to the base layer of money. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, but uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, so uh, uh, could there be like any other factor that plays into like, uh, are there any other reasons why, why, you know, it, it led to this, you know, corrupted or, or extremely flawed and, and, uh, and, and uh, I don't know, it's, I mean, it, it is, it is a theft system after all, but, but uh, are there any other reasons? Like, could it be because of the, the issue of trust, because, you know, that we often hear or, or we often read, you know, even in Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto's words, it's the trust that, you know, that we had to put into all these centralized institutions is that relevant at all? The, the trust issue, the non. You know, if you go, you know, if you go through the checklist of, uh, if you compare gold with Bitcoin, uh, you know, would it be verifiability, uh, scarcity, um, uh, you know, the, the 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 potential, you know, uh, is it is it is it uh, is it valid? Can you validate it like like you can in Bitcoin? I think that there absolutely is um, 
a, a disruption that happens with trust, uh, especially at the institutional level. And you have to look uh, carefully at the 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 ways in which legal monopolies disrupt the natural order that emerges in societies via the free market. Uh, generally speaking, in a free market, those most capable at solving a particular problem rise to the top of that industry uh, via profit, right? Profit is the feedback reward mechanism. And, and this is no different in the creation of money. Um, in the cases where a market is choosing the money, and the money has the properties that the market desires. Uh, let's use gold for an example. Uh, there are certain individuals that rise up that are skilled at uh, obtaining that commodity, right? They're gold miners. They develop specialized equipment and personnel and uh, strategy to go into the mountains of the world and pull this gold out of the earth and turn it into bars and coins that can, we can be used for commerce. And they're paid for that process. Uh, and likewise with Bitcoin, right? We have these specialized actors uh, who know enough about the process that they can build these giant warehouses and mine at scale to produce the hash power that the market demands in order to use this decentralized distributed currency, right? Those are market forces uh, that, that allow that to happen. Whereas with government, uh, when you have the, the legal monopoly that is the money creation via the Federal Reserve, you're stepping in and, and interceding within that process that normally occurs naturally within the market. And you're disrupting um, the natural ebb and flow of, of the market making decisions around that process and deciding how it values that. Uh, we don't have a way to, to intercede in the money creation process of the Fed, at least we didn't until Bitcoin, and say, you know, I don't value this as at what it's being valued at. That, that's really all a market does. Uh, is, is constant subjective value decisions by individuals all over the world. And when government takes this power, seizes this power of seniorage to create new money, and not only that, but to indefinitely uh, perpetuate their debt Ponzi and, and expand their balance sheets and expand their expenditures at unprecedented exponential rates uh, throughout you know, uh, the course of a century. You know, you, you see a lot of waste, you see a lot of bureaucracy, you see a lot of rent seeking, uh, you see politicians giving themselves bonuses before they uh, give their bailout checks to the uh, to the American people like you're seeing in, in Congress right now. Not that I'm for wealth redistribution, but you know, it is what we're seeing. Uh, you, you see uh, educational professionals that perpetuate government ideologies like fiat money and Keynesian economics, even though they're very damaging to society, they're good for the government, for the, for the purposes of the government, right? But these things are mostly funded by government dollars. You know, if you track the way that subsidies work for education and all those things back up the chain, it all makes its way back to fiat money and government spending and expansion of government debt and government securities. So I really do think uh, that when you, when you ask the question, like, are these things related to the breakdown of trust? I think that they absolutely are. Yeah. And um, if we go back to, to the, you know, monetary properties or, you know, properties or uh, factors of, of gold, I mean, you always hear, you know, the stock to flow ratio, how much uh, allegedly, you know, how much gold there exists, but we don't have really a proof of that. And that's the, I think that's a fundamental difference between Bitcoin and gold or, uh, or whatever, because it's just an estimate after all. I mean, with the, with the 296,000 tons or 200,000 200, tons and how many tons, you know, actually in reality have been really accumulated in the last weeks, months and years by central banks and how much there is and how much actually more gold can be produced at will if enough sufficient, you know, sufficient time, energy, resources, technological innovation is put into the mining of gold. Uh, it makes it a little bit clownerish to, to think about it, to be honest with you. I see there. Yeah, yeah, I'm just reflecting on what you said there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with that. I. You know, I, I wonder, um, I don't think that we yet know, because it's obvious that Bitcoin is, is, an, is an order of magnitude better than anything else that exists in terms of uh, the, the objectives that it seeks to fulfill. Uh, I don't think that we yet know to what degree some of the properties of Bitcoin are, to what magnitude 
uh, they are better. You know, things like verifiability. Um, certainly, right, gold is verifiable, uh, but it's much more difficult to verify and it's much more expensive to verify. Uh, and, and that's what technology kind of does, right, is that it, it reduces the marginal cost of production of various things. And, uh, and it also uh, makes life easier in certain ways or it eases discomforts in certain ways. Uh, and, and there's marginal cost saving there, right? There's, there's uh, savings of energy and time. And, uh, that, that, and then those savings, those cost savings, those energy and time savings can be redistributed to elsewhere in society. And there's so much waste in the fiat system. Uh, so we have to, we really do have to wonder, you know, and this goes back to the question you asked me uh, earlier, how, how different is the world going to look when we can save ourselves from all of this waste? Um, and, and this goes back again to like what, what I was saying earlier about the, the expenditures and the monopoly uh, on seniorage and, and debt expansion and all of these perks that the government enjoys at the extent of their legal monopoly. And as you just mentioned, um, their monopoly on coercion and on violence, you know, you don't end that overnight, certainly. And that power isn't giving up willingly. There's no evidence that, that in history of, of those types of things ever being given up willingly by any government, no matter who votes the people holding that power into power. Um, and really, you know, the, the incentive structure of our democracy, or if you want to call it that, is, is so disrupted and so tainted and so backwards. Uh, and and you, you probably couldn't have foreseen that, you know, as, as a constitutionalist writing out the bylaws of government in the early days of the American revolutionaries. So you, you could not have foreseen the ways in which the incentive structures would be disrupted uh, 200, 300 years down the line. You, you just wouldn't have had enough information. So I think that the, the, the thing that Bitcoin does that's so revolutionary for us in terms of fighting back against the expansion of government totalitarianism and overreach is that it disrupts the ability to fund the expansion of these, these you know, shadow government organizations, the occult, as you called it, that, that which happens in secret. Um, that which we have no control over, the unelected bureaucrats, right? There's a reason that these things continue to expand and you can trace it back to Woodrow Wilson and, and the Anglophiles, the thinkers in the United States who admired the, the administrative bureaucracy around the monarchs in England. Um, they wanted to bring that to the United States because they believed that it was the administration who enacted the will of the sovereign, right? Who, who told the people what they ought to think, who steered public discourse in the direction that it ought to go, according to them, right? But that's not we, what we believe in a democracy and in a free republic or as libertarians or as Austrians. Um, we believe that the individual is best informed to make decisions for themselves and for their families at the local level. And that they should be given the autonomy to do that and that right to private property and pursuit of liberty and pursuit of happiness uh, should be protected at all costs. And that is a government's job. Uh, but we've seen a, a total 180 from that ideological first principle and power given to that, that turn away from first principles by the hands of the state, by their ability to fund whatever it is that they want to do. So I think that in the sense that Bitcoin will, will fix a lot of these problems because it will defund the state's ability to continue to overreach. Totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah, super. Um, you know, I've, I had some talks also with Jeff Booth together with Titus Gable of Free, Free Private Cities. And I'm a total believer and I trust, you know, in the power of self-sovereignty and and and. Uh, privatizing or, you know, on a contractual basis, like you, you just said, you know, what is the role, what is the function of government it is to serve, actually. I mean, it's actually, you know, the, the role of the government should be simple terms like to protect liberty, freedom, um, the lives, the, you know, the, the health <laughs> of people and, and really uh, create the structures, the, the foundation so that the people can prosper and, and, and unfold, you know, within their and unleash the power, the self-sovereign individual power and become, you know, happy, uh, you know, as, as you can also, you know, as we can read or uh, we always hear in the, uh, you know, I mean, I lived like five years in America and I used to like, you know, like what do you call it in front of the flag, do the Pledge of Allegiance and <laughs> I'm like, 
but what does it really mean? You know, like, do we really live? I mean, the, the Constitution in the United States are, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was raised in Austria. And so I, I somehow, it's, it was good, you know, to, to get this experience, to, to, to have a comparison, the mentality, the, the emotional feeling, like, what does it feel like? And I think there's a lot of hypocrisy or, or I don't know, ignorance or, and then on top of that, you've got the conditioning, the indoctrination, the media, this whole thing that's going on. And of course, the, the hopelessness and the, uh, and, you know, not being really in power. It's, it's, it's really frustrating. And, and, you know, and as, as a lot of Bitcoin is say, and, and, I, and, I, and I can only, you know, uh, compliment that is like if it wasn't for bitcoin i think a lot of us would be just de depressed and hopeless um so i don't know where i was going with that but let me just uh, uh read one of another question um from a, one of our followers vincent baumhoff asks what does he think what what does uh heavily clown heavily armed clown think about the fed's definition of inflation is it mere cpi higher education, higher uh, health insurance, ch child care, and real estate seem to defy this. And how does one reconcile inflation with technological deflation? I think a definitive explanation warrants a Nobel Prize. <laughs> you want me to? So, yeah, <laughs> okay. Good. Sorry, what was that? No, do you want to read it for yourself? It's on, uh, not if it's on Twitter. I'm not sure whether it's uh, long. So I might have to have you repeat the second half, but uh, the, yeah. as regards to what I think about the Fed's definition of inflation, I think it's entirely useless. Um, I, I don't think that you can, I don't, the idea that price inflation uh, is a, so there's two different kinds of inflation. There's price inflation and monetary inflation. The idea that price inflation is a measurable, um, graspable basket, right? That, that you could create an index out of price inflation. Because when we look at prices, we would need to take into account the prices of everything across the entire spectrum of society, right? Because everybody in the world is an individual. And if anything has a price, well, then that means somebody somewhere desires it for something. And you might not buy that thing. You might not subjectively value that thing. You might rather have, uh, th and this is what Mises talks about in human action, is that you know you, you can have A plus B equals C, but uh, C minus A might not equal B because of the way in which um, individuals subjectively value things in a society. You cannot create objective rules around that value, right? So it's, it's the same thing with this and, and the idea, because you might want two gallons of milk per day and I might only want one, right? You might have 14 kids and you might need a lot more milk, uh, but the price index of a weighted basket of goods would say, well, no, you get one gallon of milk and, and it affects both of you the same, right? Because that's how we've uh, extrapolated out the data here at the Federal Reserve. This idea is entirely arcane and absurd and could only be come up with by fiat economists who are trying to protect the government's ability to expand the money supply. I think that the only useful definition of inflation, because price inflation is so arcane and so absurd, um, the only useful definition of inflation is monetary expansion. You look at M2, you say, all right, how much did M2 increase? That's your inflation. The way that it affects prices is, is um, impacted by so many variables, technological deflation, uh, demand, uh, changes in, in the nature of production, uh, distribution of goods, distribution of services, uh, the, the greater health of the economy and whether or not people have excess capital and what types of value decisions they need to make with the capital they do have in the moments. Uh, the weather, I mean, everything inf impacts prices. It, it's, it's totally absurd to think that you can use it to measure anything meaningful whatsoever. Yeah. But I'm going to need you to repeat the second half of that question because yeah, I don't sure. remember it. And then the second part, it says, how does one reconcile inflation with technological deflation? I think you've already answered. I think it, a definite explanation warrants a Nobel Prize. So, no, it says, what, is the, what does he think about the Fed's definition of inflation? Is it mere CPI? 
higher education, health insurance, childcare, real estate seem to defy this. Yeah, I mean, we, we know that, you know, that the CPI is a totally deceptive measurement of, you know, of, of purchasing power, right? Or of uh, inflation. Right. It's the CPI has changed three times, I think, in the last 30 years. Um, you know, they've they've adjusted things like mortgage costs and allowed for substitution where you can uh, take the local rent price rather than a mortgage cost. Right. Which obviously extremely disrupt when real estate's very expensive. That's going to disrupt uh, the nature of price inflation within certain jurisdictions. And we have to keep in mind that these things are local, right? There might be a lot more demand for real estate. There might be a lot more price inflation for real estate in San Francisco than in middle of nowhere, Tennessee, right? So th these things are not equal and they're going to affect different people within the whole of our, when I say our, I'm referring to America and certainly probably the entire world too. They're going to affect everybody differently. Right? So you can't put a number in a basket and say, this is the number and it applies to everyone. It's absurd. Uh, and, and in regards to the, the technological deflation piece, you know, I, I think that we've had major technological deflation in spite of the monetary expansion that happens at the hands of the federal government and at the Federal Reserve. Um, we, we've had tremendous leaps forward in quality of life because of technology deflation and in spite of monetary inflation. Because te technology is inherently, would you say, deflationary? Because it's, you know, as Jeff Booth always says, you know, sort of, it's like gravity. It's like, it's totally antithetical and, in, uh, you know, in uh, 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 diametrical opposition to, to inflation. And, and so it, it's like two different forces, right? The, the central banks, the fiat system and technological innovation. Absolutely. I mean, you can... I, I tend to find that with economic concepts, the best thing to do is to think about it at the smallest scale possible, right? So rewind the clock thousands of years and, and we have a tiny little village, right? And the village has to, every man, woman, and child in the village has to work all day long, every day in the fields in order to produce enough food uh, to, for everyone to be able to live through the winter, right? And, and one guy uh, comes up with a tool or a process or a system that makes their efforts of producing food to feed the village a little bit more efficient, so much so that 10% of the men and women and children no longer have to spend all day long toiling in the fields and they can go and work on something else, right? Well, now the same number of food is produced or more at a lower cost of human capital, right? And that frees up resources for other people in the society to go and do things or, and, or, you know, in, in a totally free market system, that food is obtainable for a lower price. And that frees up capital for other economic activity, uh, both human capital and you know, capital in the traditional sense, like money. Um, and, and that's good for the village as a whole, because now those people that are no longer forced to work in the fields all day can uh, try to produce clothes or try to go hunt meat or try to uh, build better houses or try to you know, improve their education. Uh, all of these things make society better as a whole. And it's very simple, right? The technology decreases the marginal cost of production of the finished good and service. So, yeah, totally agree with you. So, you know, if we're already seeing this technological innovation in specific sectors, this is what I'm a little bit complain about because for me, there's just too much focus on, you know, I mean, it's great that we have, you know, mobile phones and, you know, the internet, the the AI, machine learning, computer, it's like more in the digital realm. But I think, uh, and I think this is a fundamental question which needs to be asked and discussed in my, my opinion, is that as we're going, as we are evolving into this new monetary, economical, social, uh, even, you know, uh, technological um, uh, structural uh, phase, um, I think we need to, it's our responsibility individually, but also collectively, not only the Bitcoin space, but like if we truly want a better civilization, we need to create those structures. But that also means structural change, structural transformation in other technological sectors, such as whatever that is, you know, whether it be energy, whether it be, you know, uh, nuclear, plasma technology, transportation, energy, engineering conversion, environmental cleansing, 
uh, habitation. You know what I'm, what I'm getting at? I think this is fundamentally important. We need to prepare society because, I mean, we are, because, there, you know, you always hear this argument, oh, we are too many people. we got to, you know, <laughs> depopulate. I think they're working on it already, you know, to depopulate the, you know, the global population. I mean, this is absurd. You know, this, this planet Earth has at least, you know, space uh, for abundance and prosperity for at least 30 to 50 million people, in my opinion, you know, but we just out of out of pain and necessity comes then the, the technological innovation creativity. What's your take on that? I'm assuming you meant thirty to fifty billion, right? Yeah, I think you said a million. I'm sorry. Okay, I was like, hmm, <laughs> this guy's interesting. So um, yeah, and, and I, I think again, like a lot of this can be. So Eric Weinstein, I don't know if any of your listeners are familiar with him. He references WTF happened in 1971 frequently. Um, and, and he doesn't really see it eye to eye to, to us with us on a lot of the economic issues that we like to point to. Um, he actually thinks that the, the driver for all of the disruptions in the data that we have on our website are caused mainly by the fact that, you know, there have been no more breakthroughs in, in things like physics since 1970s. Um, we think that that's a little bit obtuse, but you know, certainly that's an issue that we should look to and we should try to identify the cause for and, and the effects of. And I think uh, that, that we're at the point where the market is sort of strangled the, be, because of the nature, because we have to devote so much time and energy and capital to financialization. And because the government controls such a large percentage of our, of our productive output, uh, and because the government doesn't produce anything, it only consumes resources. And because the government has such a stranglehold on things like education uh, and, and on public policy. And when, I, and when I say public policy, I don't necessarily mean like the laws that affect our life. I mean like um, the, the, what we talk about, right? What, what is the narrative in society? What are people concerned with? Um, I, I think that that's had such dramatic effects on our on the market's ability to satisfy, um, to profitably satisfy demand and and problems in the world. That I, I think that again, I think that the money is the major cause here for for a lot of these problems. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I think once the seed has been sown, it just um, it just needs this problem. I, I have the feeling somehow intuitively that this is, as we can see, you know, all these institutions now finally waking up and with it be, you know, the Michael Saylor's, the hedge funds, whatever, and then soon the pension funds and, you know, the family offices. And they finally, you know, they see it as a reserve asset or as an inflation, uh, you know, a capital escape uh, because it's all melting away. So, um so I think there is this chain reaction that we will. I feel it's it's going to come much sooner and uh, and really unexpectedly faster than we can anticipate. What do you think? Sorry, I just realized I didn't have a light, but uh, now people can see my face. Uh, yeah, I do think it's going to happen. I think it's, I, I'm probably the, the closet most bullish of anybody. And I, I'm saying that I'm closet the most bullish because I don't like to make ridiculously silly price predictions. But I keep looking at this thing, man, and I look at the, the increased demand. And not only that, but I look at the problems that Bitcoin solves. And when guys like Michael Saylor come along and they just become Bitcoin experts within the span of like, a few months, right? And I'm not not just like, hey, I like this thing, I'm going to buy a little bit, but like, hey, I like this thing, I'm going to take a billion dollars of my company's treasury value and dump it into this like market buy, right? I'm just like, we're not ready for this. Like we are discounting the the nature at which this technology is going to explode and its value, potential value by many orders of magnitude i think i think any price prediction you know i i don't think it's a secret that for anybody that follows me that i'm really not a big fan of like the stock to flow x model um plan b has me blocked on twitter for liking comments that criticize it really i, I don't i i don't care i don't i don't think it's austrian you know i 
Well, I have all the respect in the world for, for Bitcoiners. I really do. I, I think it's okay that we disagree on certain things. I don't think that, uh, I think that Mises spoke out against econometrics and, and quantitative analysis and all these types of things. And, and I really think that that's what stock to flow X is. I don't think that supply side models can be used to predict prices. Um, but you know, it's, it's totally fine if people disagree with me on that and I'll be happy to be wrong, right? Because the model is very bullish and if it holds into the future, that's good for me and that's good for you. And I can just be the idiot that didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, but um, to be honest with you, I mean, uh, Colin, I, mean, I think the the, uh, the plan B's stock to flow model is actually, I told him that actually, I said, this is just um, a measurement, you know, sort of a, a ex post, you know, sort of in retrospect, confirmation measurement thing because because it's it's way too conservative because if it goes really up and, it, and the exponential process you know becomes so fast that the adoption rate and and you know you just you just mentioned the price prediction and i always tell people what if we don't think in dollar denominator fiat denominated price prediction or price you know whatever but this is what I think Jeff Booth also tries, I think, to communicate that we have a, a human being uh, has a real difficulty understanding exponential functions. And I think we need to start thinking in purchasing power because the, the, the power that this, this you know, Bitcoin economies will, will unleash, I think, is beyond even our imagination, let alone comprehension. We're talking about like a totally new era of civilization. You know, I just, I read recently, I know it sounds a little bit woo-woo, but the guy is a highly advanced engineer and scientist. Uh, the, 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 the title is pretty funny of this book. It's like, Where's My Flying Car by J. Stores Hall. And I really love the book. And he goes like systematically, like what, what you know, everything went wrong, went wrong. You know, you just, uh, I think, mentioned about how the market somehow stalls itself or blocks itself a little bit. And of course, there's a lot of other factors, maybe even the military industrial complex or the bureaucracy, the it's just so many parameters that play into this whole thing. Why? And I think Safed and Amuz even uh, had written an article and, you know, on the uh, on the speed of airplanes that somehow they stopped going upwards since the, I don't know, when was it, 50s or 60s, instead like of, you know, seeing more innovation. And and this is this is the question I always wanted to ask him, but I never got the chance to, is uh, he got this chapter in his book, uh, The Bitcoin Standard, I think it's on page 96 to 98, uh, 98 somewhere, you know, comparing the gold standard, you know, La Belle Epoque, you know, the original zero to one innovation and then the, the one to many innovations, you know, in the 20th century and the fiat stand, on the fiat standard. And like, what if we, you know, truly understood the, the full potential of Bitcoin in an economy, uh, in an infrastructure that is totally like, you know, borderless and, and, and unlimited, with, with all these, you know, beautiful minds out there, would it be innovators, entrepreneurs, investors? People don't even have a notion what it could mean for, for their daily life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to say that we're all default Keynesians. Um, and, and especially we're, you know, even those of us that are Bitcoiners, that are well-read Austrians, that do whatever we can to um, lengthen our time preference. Uh we're all still default Keynesians, right? And, and you know that because if you look at the way that we, we value our time and we value our capital and we value our, our objects, right? We still do it in dollars, which is just this totally inaccurate, totally useless, um, eroding, constantly changing yardstick for which we measure our, our capital and our value and our, our not only like what we own and like what we can obtain, but like what we can produce for society. This measuring stick that changes in size, you know, every every second of every day and is ultimately totally useless for economic calculation. Right. And, and we know we all do this because we, we don't have a choice. Right. I'm not saying like I'm not berating people for, you know, saying, oh, that soda costs a dollar instead of saying, oh, that soda costs like 5,200 Satoshis or whatever. I'm not berating people for that. I'm saying that this is the standard. This is the default. And it affects our ability to do economic calculation and until we get to the point where um, we have this, this stable, unchanging 
monolithic value in something that is uh, totally verifiable and, and durable and um, trustworthy, right? Like Bitcoin, what, what Bitcoin, until we solve the problems that Bitcoin sets out to solve, we're going to continue to have this problem of economic calculation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it needs some time. I think it's, it's a lot of structural changes need to take place and a lot of, you know, understanding and pain points, I think. Even. I think the pain point is not there. You know, I live in European Union, Austria. I think people, most people, you know, they're way too obedient. You know, everything that the government says or any anything that is or the mainstream media is like holy and sacrosanct. It's it's really, I mean, it's really a pain in the ass when when you observe like the people around you. Um, and I think it's it's just a lot of factors. It's the mentality, the brainwashing, you know, the fears, the existential fears. It just I think it has to reach a certain threshold. Then um, you know, sort of the the conscious, the expansion of consciousness. I think is going to take place even without psychedelics. So yeah, <laughs> right. And, you know, like if you think about it, um, so like, you know, you have these Bitcoiners like who are producing goods and services today and a lot of them accept Bitcoin in, in trade for things. It would be much easier for them to price something in Satoshis rather than dollars. Um, and, and, you know, you could argue that they, you know, they, they but it, but they can't do that, right? Because the the value of the dollar relative to Bitcoin is still changing at such an exponential rate that if you were to have said five years ago that your product was worth one Bitcoin and you didn't want to change that price, you know, today that product would be out of reach of the vast majority of people. So it's it's for good reason, right? That we can't yet use this thing as like our unit of account in in daily commerce. But at the same time, it almost seems like maybe we just should. You know what I mean? Like, it's it sounds silly because we we have to constantly convert back to this most liquid money, right? And not just that, but because of the legal monopolies, because of legal tender, and it has to be accepted. It has to be used to pay taxes and all of these types of things. Um, what would happen if if we just started pricing things in satoshis? Well, it'd be really confusing. It'd be really difficult. But um, certainly, at least we'd be using a uh, a measuring stick for economic calculation that that works maybe the trade-off would be worth it i don't know yeah i mean there i mean there there are some people such as um you know extreme like uh, satoshi denominated uh, bitcoin is out there uh, i mean just i'm just thinking about uh who is it uh, max hillebrand um, BTC sessions, you know, Ben from BTC. I think these these are people that, of course, I mean, you know, it, it, we, we still live in reality. You gotta, you know, do your living expenses. So somehow they find a way to transfer back and forth between. But um, but for the average person out there, yeah, it's it's just too much ass probably. It's just too much. Yeah, the exploitation level. It's just I don't know. Yeah, and and even if they claim that they're denominating their life in satoshis, they aren't. They're, they're denominating their life in what the exchange value of Satoshis is with their local currency. That isn't Satoshi denominated value decisions. Um, if it was, you'd be saying, okay, you know, you'd be looking at, okay, there's, you know, 21 million Bitcoin and I want to buy that car. And that car, you know, is, is um, one out of a million or whatever. The, the, so I'm willing to give up, uh, 250,000 of my Satoshis, but not a single Satoshi more, right? You'd be making decisions like that totally um, irrespective of like whatever the value of your local currency that you must use because of legal tender laws is. Uh, we're not at that point yet. Even in the default, let's like I said, we're all default Keynesians. That's a funny term. I've never heard that. Default, I sub like subconsciously, we are default Fiat Keynesians. That's funny. <laughs> I, I think Michael Bitstein was the first one. Oh, really? Okay. That's who said that. I, okay. I can't remember. I think I got that from someone. Yeah. yeah whoever got to be credited for them, it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a good, you know, for self-reflection, but, uh, and for, for, you know, understanding like what are, what are our blind spots ourselves and uh, what, what can we make out of it? Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't want to take too much time of you, Colin. Thanks so much for this talk. Maybe we can, you know, repeat this in the near future in a panel discussion, maybe even together with Ben Prentice or whoever. 
And uh, yeah, do you have any final thoughts or uh, where can people find you or where would you prefer people contact you? No, man, for sure. Thanks for having me on. I'm happy to, to come and do this whenever. Uh, I apologize for my audio quality. It's not as good as it usually is. Uh, as far as where people can find me, the best place is on Twitter. I am at Heavily Armed C, mm -hmm. the letter C. Um, as far as I know, I'm the only Heavily Armed Clown on Twitter. Uh, and... You can find our podcast, Ben and I's podcast, uh, Bitcoin Echo Chamber. You know, just go to the website or look for us on whatever podcast platform, and you know, check out our WTF happened in 1971. We we're, we've been amazed. We've had almost a million hits on that website in 2020. That's amazing! So, wow! Wow! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I love it. I really love it. And I think you, you guys are doing great, great work, uh, you know, for you know, whether it be education or, or, or people who have never even dealt with the question, what is money or what, what are, the, you know, the, the causes and effects and the consequences. And, uh, and then finally, you know, going a little bit deeper into the rabbit hole of why Bitcoin. <laughs> so thanks so much again and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Merry Christmas. All right, man. Merry Christmas. Okay, cool. Bye. Have a good one. So hope you guys enjoyed this fantastic cosmic talk with heavily armed clown if you should follow him definitely on twitter check out his websites uh it's uh wtf happen in 971.com together with ben prentice and his own website is bitcoin and you know I'm just thinking, you know, once people understand the true fundamentals, the true monetary properties, the true potential of Bitcoin with its absolute scarcity, with its total decentralization, nobody controls Bitcoin, the true potential and power, you know, economical wise, technological uh, that it can unleash, uh, people will, will flock much, much faster to Bitcoin. They will truly comprehend for the first time the power of uh, and the abundance and the prosperity it can create. So, this is our job. Uh, whether you, whatever you know, in whatever profession field uh, you're do, uh, you know you're uh, active, just share these videos, share whatever materials, books, videos, podcasts, documentaries, trailers articles uh, just spread the news give them like the most fundamental thing you know people need uh, to know need to understand and then together you know first from individual sovereignty to the collective uh, you know power of 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 individual sovereignty again you know it all comes to freedom and the you know the technological the you know the structural transformation we will see in the net in the next years and decades to come it's just unimaginable so i hope you enjoyed this let me know your questions your wishes for next special guests or discussions i can arrange um really appreciate your support please like it share it retweet it uh, write a positive five star review on itunes or anywhere so it can you know accelerate uh the the distribution and uh and so it get you know, somehow the, the algorithm or whatever on YouTube or on my podcast platforms um, get somehow more more known, more uh, dispersed into the community, into the world. Hope you love this. And uh, my email address is hello at the totalconnector.com. Make sure you follow Heavily Armed Clown on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Telegram, what have you. So thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon.